444 in the songbook. Hymn 444. Let's all stand and sing. Hymn 444. Let's stand and sing I've Got a Mansion. Hymn 444. <clears throat> Verse 1. <clears throat> I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where streets that are pure as gold. Though often tented, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow of stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion of my own. I've got a mansion just over the hill in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure What a great day that's going to be, amen? I was talking to someone right before church. They were telling me about a loved one that had passed away and, and a loved one that was saved. And they're inhabiting, they're moving into that mansion right now. Amen. That's going to be a great day. You know, you, you look around in uh, the Greenwich area and you see all the really big, pretty mansions. And you drive by and think, I will never own one of those. Honestly, I wouldn't want the upkeep on one of those. You know what I mean? Or the, uh, or the uh, taxes on one of those. It, those are nothing compared to what we'll have in heaven one day. And if what we move into heaven one day is smaller, we won't care. God will change our desires. This is going to be great. The best part about heaven is going to be living in the presence of Jesus with no sin, no sorrow, no hospitals, no depression, no anger. It's going to be a great great, great place. And uh, if Jesus came back right now, I'd be all right with that. Amen. Uh, but uh, glad you're here this morning. Hopefully you find a little uh, rest, a little break from the world and uh, all of the problems it throws at you. And this place will be a, a little utopia here in the middle of your week or at the beginning of your week. So uh, thank you all for being here. Let's greet one another. We'll come back and sing that chorus in just a moment. Let's sing that chorus. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God give us a good day today. One quick note before we uh, mention your prayer request. 
we had our first game against Heritage Baptist yesterday. How many of you, how many of you were able to come out for that? How many of you were able to come out for that? Um, uh, some of you had grandchildren playing on the other team. I hope you uh, didn't betray your church. Amen. <laughs> Talking to you, Joanne. No. Um, we, uh, uh, the T-ball, our little T-ball team did not win, but the coach pitch team, we won. It was a five-inning game. Those of you that know baseball, the score was 24 to 20. There wasn't a lot of defense. It's more like a football score, right? But, uh, uh, but we won. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, so uh, we play them again in a few more weeks up at their place. But what a great time we had. Uh, churches intermingling. And I would encourage you, uh, get your kids involved. We're looking at doing a soccer league in the fall. And so uh, you'll want to keep your uh, eyes and ears peeled for that as well. Some prayer requests uh, for us this morning. Pray for uh, Pat Sastrom, a, a, a very good friend of hers, passed away this past week. So keep Pat in your prayers and the other family. And then also uh, pray for um, Linda Finelli, her mother. Linda Finelli usually sits right over here. So many of you know Linda. Her mother has just been put under hospice care and is being made comfortable and is approaching death's door. Uh, so let's uh, lift up Linda in our prayer. She's really having a tough time with that, as you can imagine. Many of you have been there with your mother, and you know what that's like. So pray for uh, Linda, and uh, pray for uh, Pat, and many others who are unable to be here because of sicknesses or other reasons. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to give us a good day in his house. Pastor Mike. Lord, thank you so much for the day that you've given to us each day. Lord, may we be thankful for it. We do pray for the needs that were mentioned for Linda and for Pat, that God, you would um, move in a special way, move in a mighty way, uh, bring healing and bring the touch that is needed to each individual. And for our service this morning, Lord, we are asking for your help and your challenge, your encouragement as we worship you today in this house. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 552. <coughs> 552 in the songbook. 552 will sing, I shall not be moved. 552. <coughs> Verse 1. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved In his love abiding I shall not be moved And in him confiding I shall not be moved Just like a tree That's planted by the waters I shall not be moved I shall not be I shall not be moved I shall not be I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. On the last. Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. On the rock of ages, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. I shall not I shall not be moved. I shall not be. I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. I have a love-hate relationship with that song. I think as a Christian, you shouldn't be moved on the things that, you know, where you're supposed to stand. But a lot of Christians are singing that song during the invitation time. I'm not moving. So... Uh, that's not the time to sing that song. Right? That's not a good invitational song, Pastor Mike. All right, Miss Rachel. All right, uh, we want to take a few minutes out of the service and recognize any guests that we have. Men, you can come on forward. And so um, they're here to give you a gift, not arrest you. Amen. So if you're visiting, if you wouldn't mind, just slip up your hand. We'd love to give you a gift and a connection card so that we can connect with you. And thank you for being here today. All right, very good. 
Today is the day we're going to honor our graduates. It's that time of the year to attend graduation uh, services and, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, so we're going to take just a few minutes and honor those who are graduating from high school or above. Just a moment here. I'm going to make sure I have my list here so I can do this. I'll tell you what, I left my list in my office. Can we do another song while I go get that? Can you just find one? And if you like organize, if you're against organized religion, you pick the right church. Amen. Come on up and lead us in something. 361. 361. <clears throat> 361. When I see the blood. 361. <clears throat> Three, six, one. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when Judgment is coming, all will be there, each one receiving justly is due. Hide in the saving, sin cleansing blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the Passion, O oh, boundless love, O oh, loving kindness, faithful and true, find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, Since pastor's not back yet, if someone can raise their hand if they want a hymn that they want to hear a song very quickly. <clears throat> uh, Rachel? Wait a second. Oh, I don't know if we can sing that now. Pastor's back. <laughs> All right. Next time you forget something, we'll do that. All right, first we want to honor, i tell you what, whether, uh, Pastor Mike, I'm going to give each one of them a book as they come down, that would be great to stand on here. We want to honor Freddie Abreu. Freddie, if you'd come on in, um, let's give Freddie a round of applause. <laughs> Freddie is graduating from Quinnipiac University with his master's degree, and, uh, and he is graduating with a Master of Science in Organizational Leadership. And his future plans uh, involve business management and consulting. And so, Freddie, congratulations on furthering uh, your education. Freddie and his family have been coming to White Oak Baptist Church for six years now. So let's give Freddie another round of applause. <laughs> All right, next up is J.R. Bedat. Let's give J.R. a round of applause. Very proud of Jr. He's uh, uh, just completed his high school diploma through Stratford Continuing Education, and that's a big deal for Jr. to go back and get that done. Uh, we had to reach back a ways to get this information here, but uh, he was uh, three years on the varsity baseball team when in high school, two years on the varsity basketball team, two years on the varsity football team and he played one year of varsity soccer. Um, his future plans are to work on education that would allow him to enter the medical field, and he has been 
attending White Oak Baptist now for 13 years. Let's, uh, let's give Gerald one more round of applause. Next up is Tiandre Bryson. Tiandre Bryson. Tiandre is graduating from Central High School in Bridgeport with his high school diploma. Uh, he has um, completed 400 plus hours of community service. He uh, plans on working during the summer and then going to Housatonic Community College for two years and then transferring to the University of Bridgeport. Tiandre has been attending White Oak Baptist Church through our bus ministry for 10 years. Let's give Tiandre a round of applause. Next up is Bethany De Los Santos. Let's give Bethany a round of applause. <laughs> Bethany has, uh, is graduating from Basic High School uh, with her high school diploma, and uh, she is uh, an accomplishment. Uh, her accomplishments are theater and drama class participation. And her future plans are to study drama and general courses at Housatonic Community College. And she has been attending our church through our bus ministry for seven years. Let's give Bethany a round of applause. <laughs> Next up is Faith Green. <laughs> Faith is graduating with her high school diploma and her accomplishments are participating in varsity uh, volleyball. Uh, with that height, I'm sure she was spiking the ball on everybody's throat. So uh, her future plans are uh, to attend community college. She's not quite sure yet what degree that she'll be taking, but plans on attending community college. Faith has been uh, attending our church through the bus ministry here for seven years. Let's give Faith a round of applause. Next up is Margarita Salinas. Let's give Maggie a round of applause. Maggie is graduating from the University of Bridgeport with her Bachelor's of Science degree. Uh, she, uh, is, uh, uh, she graduated with a degree in medical laboratory science with a concentration in chemistry. Wow. She graduated cum, cum, cum laude of her class. Her accomplishments uh, consistently on the president's list took part in biomedical research. I can barely say that. Um, she became a tutor uh, of her peers and a teacher's assistant. Her future plans are to take her ASCP board certification in August uh, to become certified nationally and to marry Eric Ferrero. <laughs> which I believe is scheduled for this fall, right? Very good. So she's been attending White Oak Baptist Church for four years. Let's give all of our graduates one last <laughs> round of applause. You all can be seated. Thank you. You all can be seated. All right. The book you were given is a Bible promise book that will help you navigate the waters of life. You have completed a chapter of your life by getting your education, and uh, they have taught you how to study. They've taught you how to read. They've taught you how to do many things, but uh, many schools leave out the importance of spiritual understanding and spiritual growth. So that book there categorizes the various issues that people go through in life and gives you many Bible verses to help you with that. So we're very thankful for you all and hope that book is a blessing to you as you endeavor to move forward with your, uh, with your degrees and, uh, and on with life. All right, at this time we'll have our choir come and sing for us.
If you'll stand with me, take your songbook to 248. 248, we'll sing God is so good, and we'll sing all four verses of 248. Verse 1. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. He so good to me. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's so good to me. Men, you can come forward. You may be seated. Two announcements really quick to remind you of. Next week is Father's Day. And we uh, want to honor each father uh, that will be in attendance. So come and uh, be a part of that. And we'll be honoring some men that have uh, accomplished some special milestones as well. So be here and uh, be a part of that. And then men, uh, we have our camp out this Friday and Saturday as part of the Father's Day celebration. 
And so sign up for that. Come and bring uh, your boys if you have those uh, young, young men. If not, then you can just come by yourself and let's, we'll, we'll have a good time together uh, out in the woods as we um, eat good food. And we also are going to have a time of Bible reading and prayer and Bible discussion. So you want to be a part of that and be plenty of things to do, fishing and games and whatnot. And so come and, and uh, participate. If you haven't signed up for that, you can sign up in the lobby. There is a cost involved as we are renting the area where we are camping. And so if you have any other further questions, you can see me or Pastor David. But please be involved in our activities around here. Let's uh, pray as we collect our tithe offering and faith promise giving. Let's remember to be faithful to the Lord. Brother Mike Yankowski, please lead us in prayer.
All right, 1 Corinthians in your Bibles this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. While you're finding your way over there, I want to take just a moment and say something about the family month um, packet here. Uh, I put together, uh, let's see, 10 sermons on the home that were preached over the last month and a half or so, both on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. And the topics, some of these uh, you may have heard. If you don't come to all the services, you may have missed some of them. But we looked at greatest husband and wife in the Bible. We looked at the greatest father and the greatest mother in the Bible. And then two sermons were preached on uh, parenting here, Parenting 101 and Parenting 102. Uh, your home, a battle, a refuge or battlefield, Christian dating that pleases the Lord, and then children that choose to obey and honor thy father and thy mother. We have packaged these up. Uh, they are $15 a piece, which is about what it costs us to put it together with the cases and the, and the CDs and the... And the stickers are very well done. Uh, I, I did a lot of work uh, researching and studying. I have um, uh, read dozens of books on parenting and marriage. And I'm not the be-all, know-all. Uh, but for someone who is trying to find their way, let me encourage you to pick this up and uh, share this. You may have friends that don't attend church, and you can see that they're struggling in parenting. This would make a great gift to give them. Uh, and uh, if someone you know is attending church, maybe their church just doesn't teach on those things, it would be a good thing to give them. And then to pick up for yourself if you're raising a family or uh, maybe even a grandparent trying to know how to help your children raise their children. But these are for sale in the bookstore. You can pick them up after church, $15, $15 a piece and uh, 10 sermons there. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be getting, we will begin in the beginning of the chapter here. We'll read from verse 1 down through verse 8. I'll begin in verse 1, and we will read the even verses out loud together. I'll read the odd verses alone. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all. All in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit in the words of wisdom... To another, the words of knowledge by the same Spirit. We're going to continue our Back to the Basics series, talking about the church. And we're looking at this morning the gifts within the church. The gifts within the church. Let's pray. God, I ask this morning you'd help us to understand what our spiritual gifts are individually. And Lord, then to evaluate and ask ourselves, am I using these God-given gifts to further myself and my home Alone, or am I using those to further the mission of Christ and His church? And Lord, no doubt there's nothing wrong with us using our talents for the betterment of our own lives. But if we neglect to use them for the greatest work, your work, then Lord, how tragic is that? So Lord, help us to be able to discern what gifts you've given us and then to evaluate our usage of them here at the church. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This year's theme, Back to the Basics, the purpose of the theme is to teach new believers the basic fundamentals of the Bible and our faith for those who've been saved many years, to fill in the gaps of maybe where you uh, uh, have missed along the way uh, the right uh, teaching or understanding of Scripture. And I'm going to say that I've been in church for 34 years. Uh, I, have, I have heard uh, 10, t uh, probably 10,000 sermons plus and in my studying of even the basics, I have had gaps filled in. So all of us need that. All of us have things where we can grow and learn. And today, no doubt, will be one of those sermons that helps many folks who've been attending church many years to better yet understand the Scripture. And then for the new Christians, 
uh, those who are new to the faith uh, to yet grasp another concept. So uh, we started out by talking about the doctrine of the Bible, because if the Bible isn't true, then we're wasting our time. We spent the month of January looking at the doctrine of scriptural authority, biblical authority. Then we moved on to salvation, and we looked at how that one is saved, one is rescued uh, from their condemnation, their their hell-bound destination, and how they have their feet put on the path to salvation. And then now we have turned our attention to uh, the church, the church, the New Testament church, prophesied of in the New Testament, uh, uh, brought about and explained by Jesus himself, and given to us in this era of time to uh, be a part of, to uh, make part of our lives, a critical part of our lives. And so uh, there are churches everywhere, and some are uh, doing it the Bible way. Others are not doing it the Bible way. So how does church work? What is church? So we looked at the structure of the church three weeks ago. We looked at that in depth. We talked about the importance of you being here and how that uh, the church is to be lay out, laid out and structured. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the mission of the church. Mission of the church. We got a lot of feedback from many of you as that sermon was preached or after that sermon was preached. And just to jot your memory, we said that God or that Jesus gave the church three basic missions. You remember what they were? They are to teach truth. Remember we talked about what truth is and what truth isn't. Truth doesn't change with the cultural tides. Truth is just truth. Gravity was there before it was discovered. And uh, it it will always uh, be around as long as the planet's here. Uh, So uh, truth is truth and the church has an obligation to teach truth. Truth, not man's opinion, truth. The uh, uh, purpose of the church or mission of the church is to build up the believers, to make new believers, but to build up the believers. I hope that when you come to White Oak Baptist Church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, that you leave here with a better knowledge of truth and a better understanding of Scripture, and that you're challenged to go forth and live the Word of God and live what is uh, taught and preached. And we said that the third mission of the church was to salvage sinners. We got these out of Jesus' words Himself in Matthew 16. You may remember We talked about salvaging sinners. We talked about hell's fence. We talked about the the fence that exists around the pit of hell. And that fence is there not to keep people uh, from getting in, but to keep people from getting out. And people there are miserable. They hate it. The hell was not even made for them. It was made... The Bible tells us for the devil and his angels. And God uh, was left with no choice but to send mankind there when they broke his law and they chose a a, a path of death. And God uh, punishes those who die uh, under the sin curse in the pit of hell. And we talked about Satan's falsehoods. Satan is wandering about the the planet, the Bible tells us, to and fro. And he's doing everything he can to sell every lie he can to take as many people to hell with him uh, as he can. He knows his fate. He knows the Bible better than anyone here, far better than anyone here. He knows that he has been condemned to hell. He knows it's just a matter of time. He might be powerful enough to think that somehow he can beat it, but deep, deep down inside Satan knows his end is to uh, uh, spend eternity in hell, and he is determined to take as many of God's creation as he can there with him. So he sows falsehoods, and he sets up traps, and he keeps people away from the truth with the glitz and glamour of our society, and the uh, wrong teaching and wrong doctrine of uh, religious institutions around us. And we so we looked at hell's fence. We looked at Satan's falsehoods, and we talked about the church's focus, the church's focus. We talked about how that the church's focus is to keep people out of hell. We talked about the man, the little boy that walked along the shore after the tide and threw back the starfish one at a time. And while he wasn't going to get every starfish back in the water, the ones he did get back in the water were salvaged from the fate of dying there on the shore. Now, Institutionally, how do we keep people out of hell? That's our calling as a church. How do we teach truth? How do we build up believers? How do we fulfill the the, the mission? How do we function at max performance? 
You know, I've worked in several secular companies in my life. I've worked in church ministries, several church ministries. I've held, had, held many jobs along the way. My favorite types of places to go to, uh, my favorite places to go work are the places where, man, it's just functioning well. The leadership respects the employees, and the employees respect the leadership. Everyone knows what their job is, and everyone functions at peak performance. Everything moves forward properly. There's nothing worse than office drama, right? Nothing worse than going into work and knowing that drama is swirling. There's nothing worse than knowing that the company is not doing well and layoffs are looming. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that type of work environment. And I got to say that in the realm of church, uh, we need to have a church that is functioning at peak performance, functioning at max performance. Now, God has given each church and this church specifically talented people, gifted people. Uh, who are to use their spiritual gifts to further the church's missions of teaching truth, building up believers, and uh, uh, salvaging sinners. Some of you here, God has given you multiple spiritual gifts. Others here, God maybe has only given you one spiritual talent. But everyone, every single person here has a talent, has a gift that God has given them for the contribution of furthering the mission of the church. So, what are the spiritual gifts? We'll be looking at that this morning, answering that question. Uh, They are laid out in Scripture for us. Uh, Let me ask you this. Are you using your spiritual gifts the way that Christ wants you to, or... Are you too busy building your own empire and letting the mission of the church go to waste? JFK, President Kennedy, famously said, Ask not what your country can do for you, but what? Rather, what you can do for your country. And I would like to say likewise, ask not what your church can do for you. Well, the pastor didn't shake my hand last Sunday. I don't think he likes me. I had a hangnail and the pastor didn't call and check up on me. (laughs) Ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. It's not about advancing Pastor Lejeune. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with advancing the cause of Christ. It has to do with altering someone's destination from hell to heaven. Now, as we get ready to dive in and understand this topic, let me add that for some, this topic of spiritual gifts is a difficult one for many people to understand. Many religions disagree on these gifts. And you'll understand more about that why in just a moment. But I believe that if we properly and thoroughly read and understand the Bible, that there can be and ought to be great clarity on this topic. White Oak Baptist Church attendees and members, I I propose, one, our identity, uh, 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 that we must, one, identify what our spiritual gifts are, and two, identify whether or not we are giving those gifts to the church and for the Lord. Now, you say, Pastor, why should I do that? Well, if this is done, if you give your personal spiritual gifts to the Lord the way you ought to, if this is done, then hell's population will be diminished. Broken, discouraged people will find hope. The programs and ministries of the church will move forward and God will be glorified in a greater way here in our community. So let's, let's jump in this morning and look at four truths about this topic of the spiritual gifts 
within us, the spiritual gifts within us. All right, the first part of this will be uh, more academic in nature, and then I'm going to get into challenging you here in a few minutes. But the I, I need to lay the foundation with the understanding so that you can be challenged. So please pay attention on purpose here at the beginning of the sermon, and uh, I promise you uh, I'll hold your attention a little bit better in a few minutes. Number one, notice the classifications of spiritual gifts, the classifications of spiritual gifts. So if you open the Bible and you look for spiritual gifts, uh, you will find four distinct passages that discuss what the spiritual gifts are. Uh, those passages are 1 Corinthians 12, um, uh, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4. That is where the spiritual gifts within the church are laid out. So some of these are repeated. Uh, in the four passages. So I have uh, done away with the duplicates and I have compiled a list of all of the spiritual gifts that are in the Bible. So let's go through these really quick here, rapid fire. They're going to come up on the screen one at a time. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to put on your express writing hand and write fast. Okay, first one here, uh, and if you're sitting in the back, you're going to have to listen closely because they're going to come up small on the screen. I'm doing that on purpose because I want them all on the screen. Okay, here we go. Prophets, or future tellers, prophets or future tellers, uh, ministers or the, uh, or the gift of helps, okay? teachers, exhorters, givers. The next one is rulers, called administrators in another passage. All right, next one is mercy givers or those who extend mercy. Counselors or words of wisdom as it's described in another passage. Faith, the gift of faith. All right, the next one, healers, healers, um, miracle workers, miracle workers. The next one is spirit discerners. That doesn't mean they cast out demons. That just means they're able to sense when someone's having a tough time, all right? Someone's discouraged. The next one is tongue speakers, tongue speakers. The next one is tongue discerners. And then apostles, and then evangelists, and then words of knowledge, and the last one is pastors. Those are the gifts that are in the Bible. Now, um, there are other gifts that are not in the Bible but can contribute to the church, all right? Uh, singing, playing a musical instrument, these aren't going to be on the screen, but just some off the top of my head. Uh, these can contribute in a great way, and I'm sure there are others that uh, we, could, we could work to compile a list, but uh, these are the ones that are in uh, the Bible, all right? So that is the classification of spiritual gifts. Let's move on to number two. Let's look at some clarification about spiritual gifts, some clarification about spiritual gifts, all right? So here you have all of these gifts, and some of you right now are nervous because I put things like healers and miracle workers and tongue speakers on the screen, and you're like, well, pastor, don't you know? Uh, yes, I know. We'll get there, okay? So just be patient and settle down, all right? Settle down. All right, some clarification about spiritual gifts. Letter A, let's talk about first their purpose, their purpose, all right? So uh, there are, uh, what I can find, two major reasons why God gave you your spiritual gifts. By the way, throughout the sermon this morning, I want you to try to identify what you think are your spiritual gifts, what God has given you uh, to do and, 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 uh, and uh, to be good at, all right? Uh, so what are those purposes? Well, first notice the, uh, is to edify Christ. Now, that word edify uh, comes from the same root word as the word edifice. What is an edifice? It's a building, all right? Um, uh, Spanish would be edificar, right? Un, un edificio, a building. That's the, that's, in Spanish, the main word for building is the word, our word, edifice, all right? And so you build up. Uh, this week I had to meet with Brother Var to talk to him about future construction projects. More about that in the weeks to come. And I, I met him at a house that he was working on. And I mean, he had that thing torn apart. Brother Carson was there, and uh, there were a couple other uh, workers there. And uh, I told him, I said, listen, I can, I can do demo, but I can't do construction. How many of you here are good at demo? 
swinging a sledgehammer, man, that's fun, all right? Um, picking up sheetrock and throwing it in the dumpster, uh, that's sort of fun. <laughs> but um, anybody can do demolition, but, but not everybody can do construction. You know why? Because in our human nature, we're good at destroying things and people. We're not so good at constructing or building up people. Two quick examples of that. If it was announced that in Bridgeport they were going to blow up a high-rise, they do that from time to time, right? They, uh, they load the thing with dynamite, and they have all those pyrotechnicians come in, is that what they call them? And they strap all the dynamite all over the building, and they're going to bring it straight down. And they announce on the news, the evening news, hey, tomorrow at 10 a.m., we're going to bring this building to the ground. Man, people pour in to see that. And they hit the button, the countdown, and boom, it goes down, and man, everyone likes to watch that. But then they're going to put a new building there. No one shows up to watch the construction. Watching construction is not fun. Watching destruction is fun. Uh, how many of you men, when you were little boys, you like to get into cut-down contests? All right? Be honest here. My hand's up. Cut-down contest. And you, your mom is so this and your mom is so that. All right? Uh, cut-down contest. My children think that is hilarious. They'll stand around and make fun of their own mother to each other. I say, do you, don't you, your mom's in the next room, knock it off. But they just think that's so funny, talking about how ugly and all those other things that they say that she is. So they love the destruction. I've never seen two little boys get into a build-up contest. Never seen it. Another uh, analogy here is they say that bad news travels around the world twice before good news travels around the block once. You ever post uh, some salacious rumor on Facebook and you check your phone in an hour, and it's got like 30,000 shares. And then you post a Bible verse, and you come back in three days, it's got two likes. All right, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but I don't know how that stuff works. Uh, we, we, uh, we have a church Facebook account, and I do have access to that. There are several of us here that do. I don't see news feeds. I just see what the church posts. That's it uh, through the particular app that I use. And we try to figure out what will get you all to like posts. And... Um, you all need to be more spiritual and like the church's Facebook posts, all right? Yeah, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Amen, Angela. Uh, she, uh, she's, she, there's several of us that help. She's one of the others. But uh, uh, edify, so edify Christ. What is the purpose of the church? It's to build up the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, to take His name and His cause and push that out to the world. Look at chapter 12, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now ye, all of us, are the body of Christ and members in particular. So by advancing the cause of Christ, we're advancing our own selves. So as you give your spiritual gift to the Lord, as you give your spiritual gift in the church house, you are edifying Christ. Next notice, it is to edify the church. Edify the church. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and look at verse number 12. Even so ye forsake as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel, what? To the edifying of the church. The edifying of the church. The goal of, uh, the, goal of the gifts that you've been given is to build up the church. Now, that doesn't just mean the building. That means us. How do you edify the church? Well, practically speaking, invite your relatives and your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers to be here. Hey, have you found something good at White Oak Baptist Church? Have you been helped through the ministries here? Do you enjoy your Sunday school teacher? Do you enjoy the singing and the preaching of the Bible? Are you in a place where the Word of God is practical and explained and understood in a way that helps you to grow and, and be more like Jesus Christ? Did you find salvation here? Then what are you waiting for? Tell the world around you about White Oak Baptist Church and let's build up. Let's edify the church. Let's edify the cause of Christ. Now, letter B, notice, uh, we looked at their purpose. Let's look at their placement in time. Speaking of spiritual gifts, their placement in time. Now, all of those gifts that I had put on the screen, I'll show you this more clearly in a minute. Not all of them were meant for the era of time in which we live. Some of them were for a specific 
purpose and time, and they have since expired, and they're no longer around. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, let, let's do, let the Bible do the preaching. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and look, with, look at me in verse number 8. It says there, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. So, prophecies has a, an expiration date on it. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So, tongues has an expiration date on it. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So does knowledge. I'll explain that more in just a moment. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect... This is speaking of the completion of the canon of Scripture. When that which is perfect, the Word of God, is come. Do we have the completion of Scripture? Is it finished? Not only is it finished, but it's leather-bound and made available uh, in your hand or on your phone. Right? It's everywhere. When that which is finished, the Word of God, is come. That which is in part, what things which are in part. Certain spiritual gifts uh, shall pass away. Look at verse number 11. Uh, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What is this talking about? Verse 11. This is not talking... Uh, th listen, there's an application to be made to your children needing to grow up, your, your adult children or your, your teenage children needing to grow up. And I've used that for that, but that's not what this verse is talking about. What verse 11 is talking about is the church. When the church was young and in its childhood stages, it thought, uh, 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 acted like a child, but when it became a man, when did the church become uh, 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 mature? When they received the Word of God, it put away childish things or put away certain spiritual gifts. Look at verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly. We don't have the full canon of Scripture, Paul was saying, to the church of, uh, of uh, Corinth, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. So God gave the early church extra gifts in its beginning. You say, well, why did he do that? Well, there are two reasons why he gave uh, the early church extra gifts that aren't around today, and they were for this. For the purpose of completing the Bible and for rapidly growing the church. Rapidly growing the church. Paul, or Peter rather, stood up at Pentecost and he preached in his native tongue and God took his words and while the sound waves are traveling through the air, translated it into about 20 or 30 different languages. So by the time that those sound waves made it into the ears of the individuals, they had been translated into that language. God did that. Now, why did God do that? Everyone stood there and they were amazed. God did that because these people who had come for the Feast of Pentecost, they were all going to go back to their own countries. They were going to have the gospel of Jesus in their heart and the early church would be able to sprout up and grow in their own individual places. So God gave extra gifts to that time so that the church could rapidly be established. However, the church has now been well established. Could it grow more? Obviously it could. But certain gifts are not needed in today's time. So with that said, um, let, me, uh, let me put the gifts for you back up on the screen. This time, we're going to highlight certain ones that have expired. Now, there is some disagreement, even in the Baptist world, about certain of the ones I have highlighted, all right? Um, there may be one or two of those up there that if you disagree with me on, it's okay. We can still love each other and love Jesus. So don't come punch me in the mouth after church, all right? I've had people get pretty heated over my preaching. I heard when Pastor Peslak was here, someone stood up and stormed out of the back after yelling at him. So uh, I've, I've heard that account a few times. So don't do that to me, amen? If you disagree, it's okay. We can still love Jesus and love each other. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 addresses a few of these prophets. Now, when I say prophet, there's two types of prophets. There's the one who stands up and proclaims the truth. That type of prophet's still around. But someone who gets up and, and foretells the future, we don't need that because it's all right here in the Scriptures. Someone like a Harold Camping who gets up and says, and he's passed now, but who used to say, Jesus Christ is coming back on uh, this day. No, no, no. The Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour. It's right here printed in the pages of the Bible. 
Nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. So quit making stuff up. God is not going to give you an extra, uh, uh, an extra uh, uh, inspiration about Scripture that isn't in here. In fact, he even goes as far in Galatians 1 to say that if an angel comes to you with another gospel, then he is accursed. So nobody's going to give you an extra uh, foretelling of the future. All right, Another one there, healers. Healers. God still uses mankind's prayers and anointing of oil, but God does the healing. We're not going to have a faith healing service here. We're not going to have people who have been debilitated their whole life come up and have me smack them in the forehead and knock them over and then run off the platform. God doesn't do that anymore. Now, did, did God do that in the early church? Yes, but what was the purpose? You might remember Peter and John going into uh, the temple there, the man that uh, laid lame at the gate, and he touched them. Peter touched him, and he stood up and walked. And the Bible says that the glory was given to God. And Peter was able to preach with more authority, again, for the establishment of the early church. Miracle workers. God still does work miracles in 2018. That's been around since before uh, the law. It'll be around uh, after the law's gone. Uh, uh, it, it was around before the dispensation of grace. It'll be, go it'll be around after the dispensation of grace because God is a miracle-working God. In fact, every time a child is born into the earth, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. And those of you that have been there to see a child, I'll take his first breath. You know that it's a miracle. So, but God does not do miracles through mankind anymore. Tongue speakers and tongue discerners. Now, again, 1 Corinthians 13 says that when the Bible was done being written, the usage of tongues would be set aside to rest. Apostles. How many of you ever driven past a church and on the sign it says apostle such and such? They don't know their Bible. You say, well, what qualifies someone to be an apostle? They had to see Jesus alive with their own eyes after he was risen. If you're telling me you saw Jesus after he was risen, that's weird. So when the last person who was alive that saw Jesus after he was risen and called to be an apostle passed away, the gift of apostleship was gone. So we don't have that one anymore. And then words of knowledge. Now... Um, that, what this means and doesn't mean. This does not mean, this does not mean that you can't have knowledge. You have a book of knowledge right here. Right. But what this does mean is that God would give those writing the Bible extra knowledge to know what to pin down. These were the men that wrote the Bible. Do you really think that Paul could write on marriage without being married, without God giving him an extra word of knowledge to write down that? If you've ever studied Romans 8, one of the deepest chapters in the Bible, you could study Romans 8 for a lifetime and not get it all. Do you really think Paul was able to write such deep, complex doctrine all by himself? God had given him a word of knowledge to be able to do that. But now that the Bible's completed, that extra sense of knowledge is no longer needed. So that one is expired. By the way, 1 Corinthians 13 says as much. So uh, these gifts, if you come up to me and say, Pastor, God's called me to be a prophet, and uh, I'm going to exercise that in the church, I'm going to say, no, you're not. No, you're not. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says as much, all right? So the clarification. Number three, notice the comparison to the human body. Now, here's where we leave the... Uh, uh, well, rather, let's throw the next slide up there. Throw the next slide up there for me. These are the ones that we're left with in the Bible. This is a very important part of the sermon. I can't skip this. Ministers. By the way, some of these up here, we're all called to do. You're all called to give. Can I talk to the church for a minute about this? I know this isn't the fall and it's not my tithing sermon. But I'm going to take just a moment here. As in most churches, it's true with this one, most of the giving is done by just a few people. That's not healthy. Now, this is God's church. He'll finance it. But someone's got to pay to keep the lights on. Someone's got to pay to uh, make sure that uh, the bills are here paid, the missions checks goes out, the salary of the staff is paid, and the, the tracks are printed. The, 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 the electricity works to run the vacuum cleaners. God has commanded each of us to give and do our part. And we're to do it with a cheerful heart. 
And if we're all just relying on a few people, then in a sense, aren't we freeloading a little bit? Freeloading just a little bit? I really want you to ask yourself, am I doing my part in giving to the Lord? God has commanded each Christian to give 10% of their income back to Him. Now, that's just the bare minimum. That's the bare minimum. You say, Pastor, we can't get by on 90%. And I'm going to say, 90% in obedience to Christ goes way further than 100% in disobedience to Christ. How many of you here have experienced that truth in your own lives? Would you raise your hand? Keep them up for a minute. Look around. Look around. I, I can put both hands up. You can put them down. I have cheated God and not tithed at stages of my life. Not any time recently, but at stages of my life. And I'm going to tell you, he sent problem after problem after problem after problem. And he said, if you're not going to tithe, that money belongs to me. I've given it to you to steward. You are to give me 10% back, and I will let you keep the 90. And like the fishes and loaves, I will multiply them to cover all of your needs. God has been faithful to me. Every year, over the last several years, my wife and I have increased our missions giving to the Lord to further the gospel around the globe. Not much each year, but a little bit each year. And you know what? Sometimes I'll look at that and I'll say, this is a total faith step of faith. I don't know how the bills are going to get paid, but we're going to do it anyway. Not raising it much, but a little bit. But even that little bit's a step of faith. And you know what? God's been faithful every time. God multiplied the fishes and he multiplied the bread and he fed the crowd because God is the one that owns your money and if you're short and you're obedient to him, he'll replace it and give you more to make up the difference. Some of you here though, you uh, are really good with money. God's given you the ability to make lots of money. I don't know here who here has lots of money in the bank and those don't and please don't tell me. I don't want to know. Thank you, John. <laughs> I don't want to know. Um, but you know who you are. That's a gift. Now, we're all called to give, but some of you have an extra uh, ability, an extra ability to give. God has given you the gift of being a giver. How about the gift of being a minister? The Bible tells us, uh, in, especially in the book of Mark, that he came not to uh, be minister to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. We're all called to minister, but some of you here are even a little better at that. How about mercy givers? Matthew 5 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We're all to show mercy to those that are without. How about the gift of faith? We're all to walk by faith. In fact, without faith, Hebrews 12 tells us, it is impossible to please him. How about the gift of being an evangelist or uh, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ? We're all commanded to do those particular gifts but some of us here have an extra ability to do that, an extra uh, inclination to do those things. Others of you here, God's called and given you an extra ability to be a teacher or an exhorter, encourager, or to uh, be a ruler. You're good at administrating uh, 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 systems and businesses and, and people and programs, and we need those type of people. Others of you in here are good at uh, uh, looking at an emotional problem or a relationship problem, and God's given you the words of wisdom to be able to count and help. Others of you here, you can discern when someone's spirit is down quicker than anybody else. Someone can walk in and you go, what's wrong with that person? I'm going to go over and pick up their spirits. I would seem and have no idea, but you can because God's given you that gift. Are you using that to manipulate people to better yourself or are you using that to help pick up the downtrodden? And then uh, some people God has given the gift of being a pastor. And that's not just for me. If God's given you a heart to love other people, here you can use that gift within the church. Number 3, notice notice the comparison to the human body, the comparison to the human body. Back in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul uses an analogy of the human body and its functions to help us understand how a church is to use its gifts to function in unity. Letter A, notice, diversity required. Diversity required. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 14. And again, Paul here, the whole topic of 12, 13, and 14 is on spiritual gifts. It says there, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. 
And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. So the, uh, uh, he's using an analogy here, a comparison here to say that the eye and the ear look very different, act very different, do different things than, the, than uh, each other, and then the nose, and then the feet, and then all the other parts of the body. Uh, there's a phrase out there that says, opposites attract, and then opposites attack. Why is that? Why are we attracted to someone who's opposite of us, and then once we're connected to them, we then attack them? Because we want people to be just like us. Sometimes we can be so narrow-minded that we expect everyone to think like us, talk like us, and act like us. They should like the same things we like. They should dislike the same things we dislike. They should be moved by the same songs and, and, and that move us in the church service. And, and they should like our favorite sermon or, or preacher. Uh, and, 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 and that should be theirs. And if not, they are not of any use to us. And what is Paul trying to say here? He's saying, listen, diversity is needed in the human body and it is needed in a church. He's saying here that if the whole body was an eyeball, how would that, how would that body hear anything? And, and, and if the whole body was an ear, how would that body smell anything? Now, the foot and the ear. Think about your foot. If it's nasty, don't think too long, all right? Think about your foot and then think about your ear. What do they have in common? Almost nothing. Now, they're connected to the body and they're covered with skin. That's about it, right? The, the structure of the ear, the bones in the ear are, are movable, right? The foot has got lots of bones and it, it stinks, right? And, uh, you know, you, you don't go get a pedicure every now and then, ladies. It, it, you know, can really be bad. Us men, they're just all bad all the time, right? But they're necessary. They're necessary have the tendency to look at someone who has a different spiritual gift than us, and because that's not our gift, to discredit them or think of them to be less. Now, some of you here, God has given you the gift of helps. You are a great nursery worker, great nursery worker. You're ready to jump in and help all the time. Pastor, there's a need, I'm there. You need the building clean, I'm there. You need the grass cut, I'm there. You need me to set up for Sunday school class, I'm there. You need me to work in the nursery, I'm there. Hey, pastor, I can't sing, but I'll join the choir because there's a need there. I'm there. I'm involved. I want to help. I want to help. And you look at someone else who doesn't want to help as much as you, and you think, that person's not as valuable to the church as I am. But could it be that God has given them the gift of giving financially? And because they're putting such a large amount in the offering plate, the church can move forward and you can have a church building to clean. You look at that person and you turn your nose up at them and say, they're not involved in much of anything. And then the person that gives thinks, yeah, they're running around running the vacuum cleaner. If it wasn't for my money, they wouldn't have a vacuum cleaner to run. Oh, wait a minute. You might be the ear. The other one might be the foot or vice versa. They're both important and we need to value each other. You look at Barnabas in the Bible and what a role he played. He sold all of his properties and he gave the money to the church for the betterment of the poor of the church. But Barnabas was no more important than someone else who was busy sweeping out a corner of a classroom that nobody knew of, that was serving the Lord in that right. Someone else may have the gift of administration or leadership, and yet someone else might have the gift of teaching. Not one is more important than the other. They are all needed for the church and every church to properly function. Letter B, notice harmony required. Harmony required. Look with me at chapter 12, verse 21. Paul continues on talking about the body and he moves in from talking about the diversity to talking about the harmony of the body. The Bible says in the eye, verse 21, cannot uh, say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. 
Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon uh, these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uh, uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, uh, that there uh, should be no schism, division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members uh, rejoice with it. So there's no need for jealousy in the church. Someone gets honored, you ought to be happy for them. Someone suffers, you ought to suffer along with them. But uh, the larger point here is that there are some parts of the human body that are more susceptible to getting hurt than others. Your, further, your, your, your extremities that are furthest from the body, your toes. You ever been walking down the hall late at night and your children left Legos on the floor? There's nothing more painful on the planet than stepping on a Lego at 2 a.m. on your way to the bathroom. You wake up the whole house, ah, right? You ever stubbed your toe on a corner? Your liver isn't in danger of getting stubbed. It's your toe. Men, you ever been hammering a nail and missed and hit the wrong nail? Watch your mouth. <laughs> Certain parts of her body are more susceptible than others. Some are more insulated than others. And there are those that get hurt and we go, oh, they're going to prayer request again. Oh, that person's always in the hospital. Oh, that person's got family that's dysfunctional. They may be further extremity from the heart. They may need you to love on them. What if the liver quits working? It's just a matter of time until the hand stop working too. You know, the systems of our body, I ought to have Maggie come up and give us a rundown on this with her chemistry degree there, but um, the systems of the body are complex and interconnected. The muscular system needs the circulatory system. The circulatory system needs the respiratory system. The respiratory system needs the excretion system. Every system is interconnected. Every system requires the other to work on their own and in harmony with the rest of the body. For some of you here, God has given you the ability to make a lot of money. You have lots of it. You know how to manage it. To you, I would say, give that gift, that spiritual gift to the Lord. While uh, everyone here should give to God, understand your calling and give a little more. For others of you in here, God has given you the gift of teaching the Bible. Don't hoard that gift to yourself. Teach a Sunday school class. Work in our children's Wednesday evening programs. Learn the Bible and then transfer that knowledge of truth to others in a way that is palatable and enjoyable and life-altering and changing. Don't hoard your gift. Use it. For others of you in here, God has given you the gift, uh, uh, the ability to discern spirits. You, have, uh, uh, you, have, uh, you can sense when someone is discouraged faster than the average person. Don't use that gift to take advantage of people. Use that gift to encourage those who are downtrodden and then how about the gift of administration do you know that we need folks to help keep our Sunday schools organized and uh, we have a million and one things going on around here with programs and ministries and activities and we need gifted church members who will uh, who have this talent to help organize us what are your spiritual gifts we use these things to advance our quality of life at home and work but are we using them in harmony with each other to edify or build up the church? Number four, I finish here. Notice the catalyst of spiritual gifts. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 1. Now, all of us here, new to the faith or not, we've all heard of 1 Corinthians 13. It, it's an ancillary part of our culture at worst, and it is something that we've been we've seen or, or been hit uh, with at other times. And for most Christians, they don't really understand the context of 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 isn't just about how to love somebody. 1 Corinthians 13 is about how to use your spiritual gifts for the Lord. That's why it's here in the middle of 12 and 14 that talk about spiritual gifts. Look at verse 1. 
Though I speak, look here at how these work together. Though I speak with the tongues, and remember, oh, hold on, one more thing. Remember the era of time here is that all of the gifts were still on the table when this was being written. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I'm worthless. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to, to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Verse 8, charity never faileth. Look down at verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. In 34 years of Christian service and being involved in church, I have seen a lot of talented and gifted people come and go. I have seen folks show up at church, and man, the God has given them spiritual gifts are oozing from them. They've got four, five, six spiritual gifts, and they've got an iron in this fire in the church, an iron in that fire. They're acting as a hand, a foot, uh, 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 the stomach, uh, uh, the heart. They're just all different parts of the spiritual body, and they're go, 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 and they're, they're serving the Lord in all these different ways, and they're giving, and they're giving, and they're giving, but they're not loving God in the process. What happens is because... God's love is not in them and flowing through them, is not the gasoline that is fueling the engine of their love for God. What happens is they fall by the wayside. If you're serving the Lord based on your talent, it's just a matter of time that you fall apart and you quit. If you serve the Lord because He loves you and you love His church, well, you can bear all things. You can, you, can, uh, uh, you can endure all things. There's nothing that can be thrown at you that will make you quit. You just keep giving and loving and giving and loving to the Lord. So, Christian, you heard the phrase, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Get your love first. Love God, love His church. And by your very nature, you'll give of your gifts to the Lord. Christian, what are your spiritual gifts? You say, I'm not quite sure yet, Pastor. Go home and take this list. I can email or text you the list if you'd like and go over it. Ask what God has given you an extra helping in of a gift and give that for the furtherance of the gospel in this church. When you stand before God one day, it's not going to matter how many... Uh, Benjamin Franklin's you had in a bank account, a 401k. It's not going to matter the model of your car or the square footage of your house. None of those things will matter in a million years in heaven. In a hundred years, no one will even know your name. But the difference you make for eternity through the purpose of White Oak Baptist Church, that legacy will live on for an eternity. And the question is, are you using the gifts that you've been given to better your name and your home and your work, or are you using those gifts for the furtherance of the gospel? here at the church. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The gifts within the church. God has gifted you. He's talented you. Are you using those gifts for Him? One. Two, are you using those gifts out of a spirit and heart of charity and love? How many here today say, Pastor Lejeune, I'm not sure about all that, but one thing I do know is that I have put my faith and trust in Jesus to save me. When I die one day, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven, not because of who I am or what I've done, but because what Jesus did for me and my faith in his work, completed work on the cross and resurrection from the dead. Pastor, here's my hand. I'm going to go to heaven someday when I die. That's my testimony. Amen. You can put those down. How many here today say, Pastor Lejeune, I'm not really sure if I were to die where I'd go. If death came calling for me today, there's a chance that God would not let me in his heaven, and that terrifies me. My friend, if that's you and you're here today, I'm not against you, I'm for you. And I want to pray for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in the privacy in the moment with no one looking except me and you, would you just slip your hand up and let me know that you're not sure of your eternal destination? Just say, Pastor, here's my hand, please pray for me. Is there one? How many here today say, Pastor, 
I've been hoarding my gifts and talents. Not, not properly, not effectively, not efficiently giving them to the Lord at His church. The church can't move forward until I get on board. Pastor, pray that God will help me to see how I can rearrange things in my life so I can better serve the Lord at the church. Here's my hand. Would you please pray for me, Pastor? Please pray for me. I know I can do more to serve the Lord at His church to further the gospel. How many here say, Pastor, I am giving my talents to the Lord, but sometimes that love is lacking. I'm doing it out of obligation. I'm doing it out of motives that are not always pure. Pastor, somewhere along the way, my love for God has suffered. My love for His people have suffered. Pastor, pray that I will have the right catalyst in giving my gifts to the church. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? I am giving to the church, but not for all the right reasons. And how many here today say, Pastor, I'm carrying a, a trouble, a trial in my life, and I just need a, a pastor's prayer. Would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Going through a tough time. Lord, I pray for those struggling with a trial that you'd help them. Lord, may we be a church that operates at peak performance. May we know what our gifts are. And may we give them to you. Lord, there are those here who have passed their prime in life. Lord, their body will not allow them to do what they once did. Would you help them to pick up the spiritual gift of prayer? May they pray harder for their church, for the harmony and unity of our church than they ever have. But Lord, help all of us to do our part so that souls will be saved, salvaged from hell. So God, that our church can do its mission at its fullest. In Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me encourage you to come and kneel at the altar and tell the Lord that you're going to give your gifts to the church for the furtherance of the gospel. If you're here today and you don't know that you're saved, you don't know that you're going to go to heaven, Pastor Mike Rivera is standing down front. He'd love to take his Bible and show you how you can know you're going to heaven. You're here today, you've not been baptized, scripturally baptized. Our waters are ready. They're warm. They're ready. We'd love to help you to follow the Lord in that decision of believer's baptism. If you have not yet joined our church and would like to do so, let me encourage you to come and talk to Pastor Mike about that process. Let's make decisions this morning, either where you're at or here at the altar. Let's give our hearts to the service of our great King. He's coming. We've got to do our part. You can look this way. All right, how do you take a sermon like this and make it practical? Well, you find an area of our church where we need help, and you jump right in. Tonight at 4.30, we've got choir practice, and uh, that's every Sunday at 4.30. So if God's gifted you with a uh, voice that can carry a tune, you don't have to do anything more than just carry a tune. If you're not sure if you can carry a tune, ask the people that know you best and tell them to be honest. <laughs> they will be. All right? And be here and get involved in that. Um, one other area, our Sunday school classes. We need folks who, can, who are administrators to help us organize, follow up on those who haven't been coming, uh, plan class activities, keep up with the class bulletin, and grow those Sunday school classes. 
you can see your Sunday school teacher and he can help enlist you. We always need help in the nursery. There are many, many, many areas. If you're not sure where to get started, come talk to me. We can sit and talk about your spiritual gifts and how you can best use those to help us move forward as a church and reach the community with the gospel. But don't sit on the sidelines. You'll regret it one day, I promise. You'll regret it one day. Um, money doesn't, money doesn't, uh, money doesn't uh, uh, buy your way out of hell, and it doesn't buy you good gifts in heaven. Serving Jesus does. So serve the Lord and be faithful to Him in those areas. Amen. You say, I've got a family. Well, get your family involved. Do it with them. Amen. All right. So tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to continue our series. We started a couple of months back on the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about Christians that quench the Holy Spirit. A lot of us don't move forward in the Christian life because we quench the Holy Spirit. He can't work because we keep throwing water on top of him uh, every time he gets going. So be back tonight at 6 o'clock, and we'll be looking at that. Thank you for being faithful to God's house. Let's be dismissed with the word of prayer this morning. We'll go. Brother Lexington Campbell, please close us in prayer.